Hello, friends, and welcome to the PrepWell podcast. I'm your host, Phil Black. And if you have an 8th, ninth, or 10th grader with big aspirations like the Ivy League or military service academies like West Point, ROTC, or athletic scholarships, boom, you've come to the right place. My specialty, my superpower, if you will, is preparing families for these competitive programs. I'll teach you what your child should do, when they should do it, and how you can help. So stick around and prepare to out-prepare. Hello, friends, and welcome back to the PrepWell podcast. Today's show is special because it commemorates our 100th podcast episode. 100 episodes. Man, did those two years go by quickly. So first off, I'd like to thank everyone out there who's been supportive of the podcast, all of the current prep wellers, the soon-to-be prep wellers, and all of the successful prep well alumni, both parents and students, who are off doing spectacular things. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all of your ideas and your feedback and for sharing your favorite episodes with friends and family. This podcast has picked up a lot of momentum and I have all of you to thank. Now, with the 100th episode in mind, I thought I'd do a review of the 100 most important tips, advice, and insights to consider when navigating the college admissions process. And I hope that some of these tidbits will be review. That would mean that you're really paying attention and remembering some of this stuff, and that others will be new to you and help you get an even better grip on what's coming down the road. And all of these will be a small sampling of the topics I cover every week inside Preple Academy's online program. So if you like what you're about to hear and you want to hear more of these tips at just the right time, please enroll in the online program at prepleacademy.com if you're not already a member. So here we go. Number one, start your preparation early. Right after eighth grade graduation is the best time to start. That's the premise of Preppel Academy. Number two, manage your expectations. The last two years have completely changed the complexion of college admissions, and it's up to you to keep your thinking up to date. Number three, seek advice from friends, Facebook, high school counselors, obviously Preppel Academy and this podcast because it's really tough to succeed at this alone. Number four, trust, but verify. Some private high schools talk a big game early on about how much support they will give students in the admissions process. Don't assume they are taking care of everything or anything. I've heard lots of stories of parents finding out too late that not that much is being done. As a parent, you still have to have your finger on the pulse. Number five, there is now a new category of schools called lottery schools. These schools used to be called reach schools, the Harvards and the Yales of the world. They were reach schools a few years ago when the admit rates were 10%, 11%, 12%. Now that number has been cut in half, with the most elite schools now admitting 3%, 4%, 5% of students. Those are now lottery schools. Number six, the SAT and ACT still matter. Don't believe what you read online or what you see on the TV news. Number seven, get angular or spiky. Spiky is the new term here. Because it's difficult to get into competitive schools if you are well-rounded. Admissions officers are looking for one thing, that one special thing that makes you really stand out. And it makes their job a lot easier. Whether we like it or not, that's the way it is. Number eight, the cost of college. Just so we're all on the same page here. Tuition, room, and board at many private liberal arts colleges, and not just the Ivies, now costs about $85,000 a year and rising at about 10% a year. If this is news to you, brace for impact because it's coming. Number nine, 11th grade is too late to start planning for college admissions. If you want to get into a very selective college or win an ROTC scholarship or get an appointment to a service academy or get recruited as an athlete, it's just too late. 
Number 10, ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps. Many people, I would say a majority of the parents that I talk to, don't know what ROTC means. They may recognize the acronym, but they don't know what it offers. They don't know how it might help defray the cost of college and provide your child with invaluable leadership and real world job experience. So if you're curious, check out my blogs, my previous podcast episodes. Prepo Academy's military plan, or Google ROTC. Number 11, the best time to study for the SAT or the ACT is the summer before your junior year. Yes, the summer before your junior year. Number 12, a 1500 on the SAT or a 35 on the ACT is becoming pretty run of the mill these days for students who apply. To the most competitive colleges. Those are pretty high scores. Number 13, GPAs. GPAs, which used to be the gold standard in assessing how quote unquote smart a student was, are becoming less and less important. As so many schools are inflating grades, allowing for pass fail grades, and watering down the rigor of the classes to make up for the COVID crisis. Number 14, Math proficiency. If your child did virtual math all of last year, no in person, and didn't supplement their learning over the summer or get tutoring, I would assume that they're at least one grade behind where they should be in math right now. And that's something to take immediate action on. Number 15, what's on a letter of recommendation? In the beginning of junior year, Take a look at the common application letter of recommendation form that your teachers will fill out next year. See what they will be asked to grade you on so that you can spend the whole year doing exactly those things well. It's like getting the answer sheet ahead of time. Number 16, want to be college athletes. If you want to play sports in college, you should be 100% committed to this mission by the end of ninth grade. There are lots of hurdles to overcome both physical, mental, emotional, administrative, and the time to begin addressing these issues is before you start your sophomore year. Number 17, athletic scholarships. Very few sports give full-ride athletic scholarships. These are known as headcount sports. For men, only basketball and football are headcount sports. So if you think your baseball, softball, lacrosse, soccer, or a water polo playing child is on the path to get a full ride athletic scholarship, think again. Number 18, the importance of summers. I know this summer has come to an end, but you should still know that summers may be more important than the academic year when it comes to students making massive progress in their personal development. Number 19, financial aid. If you make more than about $160,000 a year, don't expect any need-based financial aid. That is, aid based on a college's perception of how much money you will need to afford college. Now, you might say to yourself, but Phil, if I make $170,000 a year, how can a college expect me to pay $80,000 of that for college every year? That's a very good question that I do not have the answer to. On the other hand, instead of need-based financial aid, you might get some merit-based aid. If your child is an academic superstar and he or she decides to go to a slightly lower tier school where they use this merit aid as an enticement to recruit them to their school. Number 20, teenage boys. In my experience, teenage boys are a much tougher sell when it comes to planning and preparing for the future. Teenage girls seem to get locked in a lot sooner. Don't give up on those boys, though, because once that light bulb goes off, they really know how to turn on the jets. The hope is that it's not too late before they figure it out. Number 21, the 4.0 GPA trap. Parents out there should know that a lot of students have 4.0 GPAs or better. I mean, a lot. So if your child has a 4 point something, they are not alone. In fact, I can only think of a handful of students who I've worked with over the last three or four years who have had below a 4.0 average. So while it sounds 
so great. And it's something to be proud of and put on Facebook. In the big scheme of things, in this day and age, a four point something is almost a given for students applying to the selective colleges. Some people say that a 4.0 is the new 3.0. Number 22, test optional policies. Please don't convince yourself that test optional schools will be easier to get into just because they don't require an SAT or an ACT score, especially now that testing is available to nearly everyone again. It was once possible to hide behind that policy during the heat of COVID, but those days are over. Just because you don't feel like studying for the SAT, or you've convinced yourself or been told that you're not a good test taker, whatever that means, doesn't mean that you shouldn't study for it and try your best. Most legitimate applicants will take the test and submit their scores. Number 23, service academies. If you haven't considered the service academies, like West Point, the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy, you may want to spend a little time exploring what those schools have to offer. They offer legitimate full-ride scholarships to everyone who attends and provide an educational experience that most value at well over $500,000. And that's not including the value of your monthly stipend and your guaranteed job that you get for five years or more after graduation. Number 24, leadership. As a junior, don't expect to walk into a school club on day one that you've never been a part of at all and expect to get elected president just because you just realize that you have no leadership so far in school. There have been students in those clubs for two years already. They've put in the time and effort, and they are most likely going to be ahead of you. So don't try to cut the line. Get involved early. Number 25, college-level athletes. If your child plays a sport and wants to play at the Division I level in college, try to assess how well their physical attributes will ultimately align with the demands of their sport at such a high level. Does your child's, what we call metrics, give them an advantage or disadvantage? For example, a male basketball player who is under six feet tall will have very limited prospects to play at the Division I level in most cases. On the other hand, a female who is 6'3 and a middle blocker on the volleyball team has metrics on her side. Number 26, reading. Reading is the primary way to study for the verbal section of the SAT and ACT. It's really as simple as that. Students cannot cram for the reading section of the test two weeks out. It doesn't work like that. Strong verbal scores normally come from being an avid and engaged reader from a young age. Number 27, letters of recommendation. These letters that will come from your junior year teachers are becoming increasingly important because as we know, SAT scores and ACT scores are slowly becoming permanently optional. Students are no longer allowed to take SAT subject tests and grades have lost their credibility. So make sure you spend some time in junior year really performing well for those teachers and getting to know them. Number 28, a backup plan. Try to find a safety school that you would like to attend almost as much as your dream school. Now, this may take some searching and some convincing and maybe a little justifying, but if you can do it, it will take a lot of pressure off. Don't get so myopically focused on one school such that any other school will be a disappointment especially if that dream school is a lottery school. Number 29, freshman year grades matter. I know there may be a few exceptions to this rule out there, but they are rare. Almost every college wants to see your grades from 9th to 11th grade, and eventually your first semester senior year grades. So start off on the right foot, and it will make life a lot easier. You do not want to start in a hole and have to dig your way out. Number 30, 66%. I use this number a lot, 66% or two thirds. This number represents how much of your body of work will already be completed before you step one foot into junior year. How do we get that number? Well, most students apply early to at least one college. So senior year doesn't even show up on your application the entire year. 
that means you're left with ninth, 10th, and 11th grade and all those activities. That's only three years. And ninth and 10th grade then make up two of those three years or 66%. So for those people who wait until their junior year to engage in this process, 66% of their profile is already in the bag and they only have one year left to make up the difference. Number 31, go the extra mile with your teachers. Don't just ask your teachers for letters of recommendation and leave the rest up to them. Make it easy for them. Make sure you provide them with a brag sheet that lists what you've done inside their classroom, outside the classroom, colleges that you're applying to, what you might want to major in, what you've done over the summer, what your aspirations are, and anything else that might help them write a compelling letter. Number 32, school clubs. If you can, get engaged in school activities and clubs in freshman year, even if you're just dipping your toe in. Because unfortunately, many students decide to not do very much freshman year because they're trying to see how they fit in. They don't want to commit to anything too early, so they freeze and they don't do anything. Don't throw freshman year away. Try something, even if it's a small commitment. Get in the game. Number 33, ECAs or extracurricular activities. ECAs are evaluated in a few dimensions. Number one, duration. How long are you participating in that activity? Number two, impact. Has the club, for example, made a difference in any way? Number three, your final position. Did you rise as far as you could have in this particular organization? The president of a club, for example. Number four, leadership. And number five, alignment. Is this activity aligned with your intended major or career or field of interest? You may not be able to hit all of these things on every activity, but use this rubric to assess which ECAs to keep and which to pitch. Number 34, college campus visits. Try to visit college campuses as often as you can, even if you have no intention of going to that school. You can still get a feel for the campus size, where it's located, the resources, the students. The more familiarity you have with campus visits in general, the better. Number 35, mind your social media. It should go without saying by now. We've heard all the stories. Be careful with social media. Even just liking a disrespectful meme or a provocative TikTok can come back to haunt you. It is not worth it. Number 36, highlight videos. If you're an athlete who is sending a highlight video to colleges, keep it on the shorter side. Under three minutes is a good rule of thumb. A coach is more apt to watch a two or three minute video compared to a six or eight minute video. You don't have to, nor should you, give them everything. Give them a few of your best moves and keep them curious and wanting more. If you wet their whistle, they'll be more inclined to watch your follow on videos. Number 37, don't go overboard. Be careful about taking too many AP classes. Know your limits. Yes, the rigor of your schedule is important, very important. But not if it means that you're going to get B's or even a C. Make a prudent decision about how much is too much based on your track record and based on what other commitments you have going on in your life. This is one of the things that shows whether or not you have good self-awareness and judgment. Number 38, AP exams. AP exams are becoming more important than ever. Since the SAT and ACT is now optional and SAT subject tests have been canceled outright, there are very few tests that measure your knowledge on an objective basis and against students from across the nation and the world. AP exams are one of these tests. Number 39, how long do I have to take Spanish or any other foreign language? If you're serious, about getting into a highly selective college, like the Ivy Leagues, most will recommend not dropping your foreign language at the first opportunity. Sometimes this comes off as, as being lazy to the admissions officers. Take a foreign language for all four years if possible. Number 40, leadership. Colleges love leaders. Why? Because leaders do well on college campuses. 
They join clubs. They start clubs. They rally their friends. They organize tailgates. They coordinate late night Wawa runs. They do stuff. They mix it up. They make things fun. So you should ask yourself, have I done anything to show leadership? If not, maybe you want to give it a try. Number 41, summer jobs. Getting a summer job is a great way to show that you're responsible, that you can show up on time and interact with the public in some capacity, show that you're interested in making money. It also shows that you have some life experience. Any type of real job can be a great ECA, extracurricular activity. Number 42, the dreaded balancing act. As parents, you have the almost impossible job of both pushing your child to perform well, but not pushing them so hard that they rebel or they mentally implode. Your job is to keep them on the seesaw until they see the light for themselves and begin to take personal responsibility for their own future. Here's a pro tip. It would be great if this happened at the latest by the middle of sophomore year. Number 43, sports specialization. If your child plays a sport that you think will help them get into college someday, please do some research or ask an expert before they put all of their eggs in that basket. How many colleges offer that sport? How many spots are there for athletes? How competitive is the sport? Do they take a lot of athletes from overseas? What do the athletes look like who get recruited? Are they big, small, strong, wiry, tall, compact? Don't be blindsided due to lack of awareness. Number 44, the GPA fallacy. Please, please don't get into arguments with your child about whether their GPA is a 4.235 or a 4.251. These details don't matter in the slightest. I bring this up because it happens all the time when I talk to families. Admissions officers at selective schools will make a very quick assessment. How many advanced classes did the student take, if any? And how many Bs did they get? That's it. If there are no Bs and all As, they will be impressed. If there are a few Bs, that will raise an eyebrow. They'll have to dig a little bit deeper. If there are mostly Bs, they will probably move on. You don't have to argue about the GPA out to three or four decimal points. Number 45, UC schools or University of California schools are extremely competitive to get into these days. It's nothing like it was even three years ago, some campuses are getting over 150,000 applications. And oh, by the way, they are not allowed to consider SAT or ACT scores, and they do not accept letters of recommendation. So what's left? GPA, classes, and four short essays. That's it. Good luck. Number 46, standardized tests. Before deciding whether to take the SAT or the ACT, please take a practice test of each one under strict test-taking conditions to see if you naturally do better on one versus the other. Don't take your friend's advice or your uncle's advice or your neighbor's advice on which one is easier, quote-unquote. This is an important test. Don't leave your success to chance. 47. Military Service Academies if you are applying to a military service academy, Naval Academy, West Point, Air Force Academy, Coast Guard Academy, Merchant Marine Academy, make sure you are constantly focusing on the big three, leadership, academics, athletics, leadership, academics, athletics. Those will be the main pillars of your application, of your interviews, and of your essays. Number 48, the athletic hook. Like it or not, fair or unfair, the quickest and most direct path into a highly selective college is through sports. Become a recruited athlete. Easier said than done, but effective nonetheless. Number 49, summers. I can't stress enough how important it is for you to map out your summers ahead of time. What big thing will you accomplish after 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade? These are precious months that you will never get back. Have a rock-solid plan for your summers and execute those plans. And your reward will be that your college application will fill up quickly before you know it. Number 50, early intervention. 
it is critical to nip academic problems in the bud. Do not put your head in the sand and just hope that things are going to get better. They rarely do. If you're confused, if you can't hear the teacher, you have no idea what's happening in calculus or chemistry or physics, stop what you're doing, talk to your teacher, talk to your parents immediately, and come up with a plan. There's no shame here. There are plenty of ways to get back into the flow. Number 51, study habits. Start building good study habits as early as possible. Sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. This is something that I hammer home inside Preple Academy, particularly in ninth or 10th grade, just in case. Where do you put your phone when you're studying? Do you keep a neat desk? Are your notebooks organized? Do you keep a wall calendar? Are you falling asleep at night with your phone in your hand? Keep your game tight from early on. Number 52, email addresses. Parents, make sure your child has a professional email address. Nothing too childish or inappropriate. I would also recommend that they start using an email address that is not tied to their middle school or high school. Number 53, highlight videos. If you're an athlete that plays a sport that would benefit from my highlight video, start taking footage as early as possible. Seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade. Even if your skills aren't quite where they need to be, you'll want to start getting used to taking the footage, downloading it, and cutting it up into a video. You don't want to wait until you actually need a video to start figuring out how to make one. Number 54, the power of an outline. Before you begin writing your college essay, in fact, before you begin writing any type of significant paper, draft an outline so that you know what points you want to cover and how each paragraph will flow into the next. And then go back and start putting some meat on the bones. So many students will start just typing and typing and typing and trying to think and type at the same time. And the only thing that stops them is when they hit the word limit. That's not a good plan. Number 55, phone use or phone abuse, I should say. Parents, do your best to stay on top of your child's phone use. I know there's a fine line between giving them freedom and treating them like a child. If they're performing well, then presumably they've earned the freedom. But if things are not going well, then maybe they have to earn back the freedom that comes with having a phone. Number 56, more on letters of recommendation. When it comes to these letters, be sure to ask your teachers at the end of your junior year. Don't wait until September or October of your senior year. By then, the best teachers will be getting inundated with requests from other students, and you will not stand out as much. Beat the rush and engage with them at the end of 11th grade, and it'll give them plenty of time to complete your letter. Number 57, the PSAT. Don't blow off the PSAT, especially the one that you take in 11th grade in October. That's the one that has scholarship money attached to it if you do well. With so few standardized test scores left to show your smarts, being a National Merit Scholarship finalist is a great way to differentiate yourself. Number 58, guidance counselor. Get to know your guidance counselor well, starting as early as ninth grade. Your counselor will write a letter of recommendation for every college for you. This is another area where you can stand out because most students can't be bothered getting to know their counselor. They're not aware of how important they are. This is where you separate yourself from the average student. Number 59, high school sports. How important are sports on your college application? Not quite as important as many parents would think. It seems that most parents think that it's it's almost a prerequisite to play a sport to be a competitive college applicant. That's just not the case. I've talked to many parents who are horrified at the idea that their son or daughter would quit soccer, for example, after playing since they're four years old. The problem is, if they're not using soccer to get recruited into a college, which most don't, then they're spending a lot of time in this activity that doesn't earn them much more credit than anything else band, mock trial, the debate team. Students don't get this mystery extra credit for playing a sport. It's just one of many activities that students can choose to do or not do if they're so inclined. Number 60, do the hard stuff first. If you ever find yourself staring down a long list of to-dos, 
and you're not sure where to start, here is a tip. Start with the hardest and most intimidating task that you probably don't want to do. You'll be glad you did. Number 61, 11th grade teachers. Get to know your 11th grade teachers well. I mean really well. Especially teachers in your core academic classes. They will be the ones who write your letters of recommendation. Number 62, the classic debate. If you have the choice between getting an A in a regular class or a B in a weighted class, what would you do? I would probably err on the side of taking the weighted class because at least you have the chance of getting an A, which would give you that nice GPA boost. If you end up getting a B, you still get the 4.0 for the class and you'll get a little extra credit for trying the harder class, for challenging yourself. If you stick with the non-weighted class, there's very little upside. You're expected to get an A, and if you get an A, oh well. Number 63, medical issues. If you're applying to ROTC programs or to a service academy, make sure you are aware of common medical conditions that might disqualify you from admissions. For example, taking ADHD medication within two years of applying may knock you out of the running. So do your homework before you get blindsided. Number 64, your college list. If possible, the best way to start your college search is by filtering for colleges that offer your intended major. Now, if you plan to major in something very common like history, this method won't cut out too many schools because most schools offer a history major. But if you plan to major in something a little more exotic, like architecture or entrepreneurship or archaeology, filtering by major can sometimes dramatically reduce the number of schools on your potential target list. Number 65, communicating with coaches. If you are an aspiring collegiate athlete, you should begin to create a communication strategy with college coaches starting in your sophomore year. This normally means a series of well timed and appropriate emails. Number one, introducing yourself. Number two, showing your skills in a highlight video. Number three, expressing your interest in their program. And number four, requesting an on-campus visit, whether it's official or unofficial. You don't want to overwhelm the coach, but you do want to make sure that they know you're alive. Name familiarity and recognition is very important and will pay off eventually. Number 66, be careful what you wish for. If you've been dreaming your whole life about getting an athletic scholarship to college and it doesn't work out for whatever reason, and there are a lot of them, take comfort in knowing that playing a Division I sport in college is like having a full-time job, which is your sport, while squeezing in a part-time job, which is your schoolwork. And maybe that's not the way you wanted your college experience to go down anyway. Number 67, nominations. If you plan to apply to one of the service academies, you probably know that you must first receive a congressional nomination. Without a nomination, you won't even be considered for admissions, or what academies call an appointment. With that in mind, I would do some research to try to get an idea of how competitive your district is for nominations. Congress people can nominate 10 students from their particular district. So you want to ask yourself, will I be competitive enough to make the top 10 in my district. Number 68, angular or spiky. If you aspire to get into a very highly selective college, like one of the Ivies, for example, it would behoove you to be extremely good at one thing by the time you apply versus being pretty good at a lot of things. The well-rounded candidate tends to get lost in the shuffle. They become forgettable. On the other hand, the person who is a nationally ranked skeet shooter is hard to forget about. Number 69, common app preview. No matter what grade you're in, it would be a smart idea to take a look at what the common application looks like. The different sections, the essay questions, the activities and awards section. Even though you don't have to fill out this application until senior year, it's nice to know what to expect ahead of time. Number 70, organization. If you're attempting to get recruited as an athlete, or you're applying for an ROTC scholarship or to a service academy, you must get organized early. There are a lot more tasks to manage 
than if you were a generic student applying to a traditional college. The process starts earlier. In ninth and 10th grade, there are more players to manage, more hoops to jump through, and more deadlines to abide by. Organization is key. Number 71, college visits to your high school. If there is a college that you're interested in giving a presentation at your school, make sure you sign up and go to it. If for some reason you can't make it, ask your guidance counselor to talk to the admissions rep and put in a good word for you. Then follow up with an email to the school, to that rep, letting them know that you're sorry you missed the presentation, but you're very interested. Demonstration of interest is very important at the more selective schools. Number 72, shadowing. If you're not sure what you want to do as a career, why not spend some time shadowing? Shadowing is when you find somebody in a job that you're interested in and you ask them if you could spend the day with them, observing what they do. You pack a lunch, you show up at 9 a.m., you sit quietly behind them and watch how they spend their day. This is a good way to get familiar with a variety of work settings. Number 73, financial aid change. If proposed legislation goes through as planned, you will no longer get any financial relief based on having more than one child in college at the same time. It used to be that with multiple children in college simultaneously, that your financial aid award would be much more favorable. Not anymore. So keep your eyes and ears open for that one. Number 74, extenuating circumstances. If you didn't get into a particular class that you really wanted to, because of some kind of a scheduling conflict or school policy. Don't worry about it too much. If it's really that important, there is a place on your college application where you can explain what happened. It's called the additional information section. Your college counselor can also weigh in, if necessary, in that same additional information section on their school report. Number 75, alignment of extracurriculars. In an ideal world, your extracurriculars will align with what you might wanna major in, what kind of career you may want, or what type of job you might want. It doesn't always work out that way, but it would make your job a lot easier when it comes to your application if your activities told a coherent story about where you want to go in college and life. Number 76, private versus public. Is it worth it to go to a private high school? Well, that depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to prepare yourself for the rigors of college academics, then in general, a very academically focused private school is probably a better bet. However, if your goal is to get into a prestigious college, then a super competitive private school may not be a good call unless you can rise to the very, very, very top of a super competitive class. Number 77, causation and correlation. Statistically speaking, the admit rates for students who apply early action or early decision are typically higher than for those who apply in the regular decision round. This does not mean that your chances of getting in are necessarily better. Many students who apply early have other things going for them. They're athletes, they're legacies, they're full payers, they're super organized, they're highly motivated. So don't think that an average application will have a better chance just because it's being submitted early. Number 78, community colleges. The best kept secret of all. If your high school career is not turning out quite like you had hoped, and you're not quite as competitive as you thought you would be, starting at a community college for two years may be a great option. You take most of the same classes as you would in a four-year college. You're saving a ton of money. And oftentimes, especially in California, there are direct pathways that will put you into one of those four-year schools as a junior that you probably wouldn't have gotten into right out of high school. Number 79, Division Three sports. I know there's a lot of hype around getting athletic scholarships to Division I schools, but the truth is very few students end up getting these opportunities for a whole host of reasons. If this is your dream, go for it. But in the back of your mind, your athletic ability may not get you a scholarship or to an Ivy League school, but it may get you into a terrific Division III school that you otherwise would not have gotten into if it wasn't for your sport. And these days, that's a pretty big deal. Number 80, 
sport-life balance. Playing your sport at an Ivy League school provides a nice mix of academics and athletics. The athletics are still Division I and very competitive, but sports are not the be-all and end-all. You are allowed and expected to have a life outside of your sport as well, which can be refreshing. Number 81, you think I can afford what? When it comes to college affordability, there are three broad categories. Number one, families that make under $150,000 a year. They're the ones eligible for need-based financial aid. Number two, families that make over $500,000 a year. They don't receive any financial aid, but they make so much money that it probably doesn't matter all that much. And number three, those who make in between $150,000 and $500,000. They're the ones who make just enough money to miss out on need-based aid, but not enough money for the college expense to be incidental. They're stuck in what we call the dead zone. Number 82, athletic commitment. If you're an athlete who wants to play sports in college at the Division I level, you should be ready to commit fully to the recruiting process by the end of freshman year. This means spending all summer training, going to camps and invitationals, and working on your craft. This means building a video library to create highlight videos with. It means researching colleges that you're interested in and contacting coaches. Yes, this is a heavy lift, so buckle up. Number 83, standardized test prep. How should you prepare for the SAT or the ACT? The best way to prepare is to do well in school from a young age, in particular by paying attention in math and being an avid reader. Now, after that, you can take books out of the library and study on your own. You can use free resources like Khan Academy for the SAT, or you can pay for some type of tutoring, whether that's in classroom or virtual or one-on-one -on -one in person help. Number 84, what's your goal? At some point, you might wanna decide whether or not you want to go to college to get a professional degree where you actually learn a skill that delivers immediate commercial value to employers, like engineering or accounting, for example, or to get a softer liberal arts degree that doesn't have immediate commercial viability majors like philosophy or gender studies. There's no right or wrong answer here, but if you're taking on a ton of student debt, graduating with a degree where you will get a well-paying job might be something to consider. Number 85, the Why Us essay. When you are applying to a college, most colleges will ask you to write an essay about why you want to attend their particular school. Most students think this is an easy question. It is not. Most students don't take a lot of time on this question, and they should. To answer this question well, you should do at least 60 minutes of in-depth research to make sure you know the details about the college beyond the marketing slogans written on the homepage. Number 86, estimating the cost of college. If you're curious about how much college might cost you, and you should be unless Number one, you have a ton of money. Or number two, you plan to be a full scholarship athlete, which is rare. Or three, you plan to get an ROTC scholarship, which is rare. Or four, you plan to go to a service academy, which is also rare. You should find out what's called your EFC, your expected financial contribution. That is, how much colleges will expect you to pay per year for college. You can find that number by going to a college that you're interested in, searching for the term EFC, and filling out their form. You might be surprised by what you're expected to pay. Number 87, campus visit quotas. When visiting college campuses, try not to go to more than two per day. Otherwise, you're going to feel too rushed, you're not going to remember what you saw, and everything's going to blur together. Two visits per day is a good rule of thumb, and make sure you take plenty of pictures. Number 88, to-do lists. If you haven't learned how to create a daily to-do list by the time you were a sophomore in high school, you've got some catching up to do. The best students map out what they plan to do each day in priority order with the hardest stuff first. Number 89, internships. 
If you're having trouble finding a traditional company-sponsored internship, think about sinking your teeth into an independent study project. It could be an online class, could be a do-it-yourself project, or a self-paced mastery class. Sometimes taking your learning into your own hands will yield better results versus waiting around for someone else to hire you as an intern. Number 90, the myth of community service. There is nothing magical about volunteering or community service. Many students and parents get wrapped around the axle here. They believe that colleges are super impressed by these types of activities or that they're looking for some outrageous number of volunteer hours. They are not. They really don't care all that much. They want to see that you're spending time on activities that you care about and that you're having impact in. Whether that means working at a soup kitchen or playing in a string quartet or stringing Christmas lights as a part-time job. So don't force march your kids to the soup kitchen every 4.5 weeks thinking that they're going to be racking up all kinds of brownie points. It doesn't work that way. Number 91, you versus your peers. When colleges evaluate your application, they are looking at how you compare to your peers in your high school. They aren't comparing you to students from other states. They want to see how you're doing compared to other students in similar surroundings. Did you take the most competitive classes or middle of the road classes or the less competitive classes? And how did you do compared to the other high performers in your high school? Number 92, LinkedIn. In my online program, I suggest that every prep weller create their own LinkedIn profile, even if it's left private. It's the perfect spot to keep track of all of your activities, your jobs, your clubs, travel, awards, recognition, work experiences. Otherwise, it's very easy to forget some of the things that you've been working on. Or if you keep hard copies of things, they're easy to lose track of. Number 93, advice from upperclassmen. If you don't have an older brother or sister to talk to, I encourage you to find a friend to talk to who is a year or two older than you are. Ask them for any words of advice that they wish they would have known a few years back. Who's the best teacher? Who's the worst teacher? Why shouldn't you procrastinate on visiting college campuses? How important are the summers? And any other insights that they might have. You can learn a lot from students who are just a year or two ahead of you in school. Number 94, the two out of three rule. As a high schooler, you may have the option to be one, a standout athlete, two, a great student, and three, a devoted boyfriend or girlfriend. The only rub is you can't do all three well. So pick two. Number 95, getting fit. If you want to be a legitimate Division I athlete someday, at some point in your high school career, I would recommend the summer after your sophomore year. It would behoove you to become as physically fit as humanly possible. I'm talking about cardio fitness, strength, mobility, explosiveness, flexibility, the whole nine yards. If you're serious about what you want, there is no excuse not to be in the best shape of your life as a 16 or 17 year old. Number 96, a signature activity. Do you have one? A signature activity is something that you spend a lot of time on during the school year or the summer or both. You've had a leadership role, you've moved up the ranks, maybe it aligns well with your future career plans or your major preference. Basically, if you were asked what your most impactful extracurricular activity has been, you would have a compelling answer. That's a signature activity. Number 97, are state schools cheap? Well, yes, they're, they're cheaper for in-state students, but I wouldn't say they're cheap. Many state schools, which are known to be cheaper than private schools or out-of-state schools, can still cost about half of some of the most expensive private colleges. That means, at times, $40,000 a year, including tuition, room, and board. That's for an in-state school. This is why paying attention to this process is so important. There is a lot at stake. Number 98, how to approach college admissions. As you think about preparing for the admissions process, you have a few broad choices. Number one, go at it alone and do all the research yourself, hopefully getting some time with your guidance counselor. This is the least expensive route. Number two, 
Enroll in Preppel Academy's online course, where I deliver all of these types of tips and recommendations and a lot more every week during your high school career. This is very affordable at $15 a month. Or number three, hire a college admissions counselor who will help you through the process. This would be the most expensive option that could cost in the thousands of dollars. Whichever way you go, be intentional about which path you're taking. Number 99, interview skills. If you are considering applying for an ROTC scholarship or applying to a service academy or both, start to fine tune your interview skills early. You will be a part of several high stakes interviews during this process. And since you're vying for a scholarship, the competition is very strong. You need to present yourself in the best possible light all the time. This means preparing for questions ahead of time and practicing your answers over and over again. And finally, number 100, my parting advice. My parting advice is that the stakes are high, both financial and otherwise. The landscape is changing almost weekly. And the best way to prepare for this process, in my opinion, is to start educating yourself early. That goes for both the parent and the child. And by early, I mean right after eighth grade graduation, ideally. And one of the only resources that provides this type of systematic, step-by-step, age-appropriate advice, starting as early as ninth grade, is Prepwell Academy. And for this reason, I hope if your child is not yet enrolled, that you will consider enrolling them and getting in the loop on all things college admissions. That's it. That wraps up our 100 tips, advice, and insights. As you can tell, staying on top of this ever-changing college admissions process has become a full-time job for families, especially those families who are trying to do it right. And I'm doing my best to bring you the latest and greatest information to make your life a little easier. And I look forward to working on the next 100 episodes. That's all I've got for you today, folks. Thank you for tuning in. If you know a parent with an 8th grader, ninth grader, 10th grader, 11th grader, even a senior in high school that might find this helpful, please share the episode with them. You can do that by finding that small box with a tiny arrow pointing up. That's the share button. Click that button. Text your friends the link to this episode. Write a little note in there recommending that they give it a listen. If you have questions, comments, or an idea for an upcoming episode, please reach out to me by email. DM me on Instagram at prepl underscore academy. Check out our blog, Facebook. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love to hear from you. Until next week, goodbye, good luck, and never stop preparing. This podcast is brought to you by PrepWell Academy. PrepWell Academy is my one-of-a-kind online mentoring program that delivers to your ninth or 10th grader a short, highly relevant video from me every week every Sunday, in fact, where I give them a heads up about what they should be thinking about to stay ahead of the game. To get these valuable lessons into your child's hands, please head over to prepwellacademy.com and enroll your child today.